greetings to all our participants and panelists. In the lead up to World Cancer Day, which is on 4th February 2017, CNS will be hosting a series of webinars on cancer. And this is one of them and the first of them. Welcome to this. Breast cancer is a serious and potentially life-threatening cancer for women, men, and transgender people. Often, people associate breast cancer as a woman's cancer, which of course it is, being the biggest killer cancer among women. But men and transgender people have breasts too, and they too get impacted. Even though breast cancer rates are predominantly high in women. So today we will be listening more on this. Before we begin, I just want to make two quick announcements. All participants are requested to please send us your questions while the panelists present. No need to wait. Just type your questions by using the chat function or raise your virtual hand. We will take the questions as they stream in during the question and answer session. I request the panelists to please present in time so that we have enough time left for question and answers. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ramsaru, a senior and widely acclaimed award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa. Over to you, Ashok. Greetings from the port city of Durban, South Africa. Friends, governments of India, South Africa and 190 other countries had committed at the United Nations General Assembly in 2015 to achieve Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, by 2030. One of which promises to reduce the deaths due to non-communicable diseases or NCDs by one-third by 2030 which includes breast cancer. Are breast cancer rates in women, men, and transgender rising or declining? Are we on track to keep our promises and deliver on SDGs by 2030? Unless we diagnose very early on, how will we reduce breast cancer deaths? And how will we diagnose early in communities where health systems are weak and fragile? Well, let me introduce the panel of experts. Priya Kanesan, Advocacy Officer, NCD Alliance, New York. Dr. Pooja Ramakant, Associate Professor, Department of Endocrine and Breast Cancer, King George's Medical University, KGMU, and Editorial Board Member, Indian Association, Association of Endocrine Surgeons, IAES. Professor Anand Misra, Head of the Department of Endocrine and Breast Surgery, KGMU, and not forgetting Brett Muller, six years breast cancer survivor and founder of Male Breast Cancer Coalition. And of course, not forgetting our erstwhile Madam Shukla, and she is the managing editor of Citizen News Service. Well, we now begin with Priya Kanesan of NCD Alliance in New York who is live currently, will talk to us live currently. Over to you now, Priya, and welcome back to CNS webinars. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Um, let me just see if my slides are viewable. Great. Um, All right, can we confirm that everyone's able to see my slides? Yes. Yes, we can, Priya. OK, great. Um, so thank you for having me today. So I'll give an overview of the current status of the global commitments to NCDs and health that governments have made and how breast cancer fits within that. Um, so I'll briefly go over the 2030 agenda. Um, I know that's been touched upon and in the interest of time won't uh, dwell too long on that. Um, so in addition to the 2030 agenda on sustainable development, governments have actually made, there are three 
global commitments to addressing the burden of, of NCDs. Uh, currently, there's the 2011 UN Political Declaration on the, on the Prevention and Control of NCDs, the WHO Global Action Plan for the Prevention and Control of NCDs, and of course, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development that Ashok was mentioning. So the 2011 Political Declaration was the first to recognize NCDs as a threat to development. Uh, the Global Action Plan, the WHO Global Action Plan, presents governments with a menu of policy options for which they can choose uh, to implement certain best practices that will have an effect on reducing the burden of NCDs and of course the 2030 agenda is the first really global development framework that acknowledges NCDs as an, as an issue that must be addressed to, um, to help achieve sustainable development. So as we know the 2030 agenda uh, provides a framework for all countries regardless of development status to achieve sustainable development in all its forms, social, economic and environmental. And so the agenda contains 17 interlinked goals, 169 targets and 230 indicators. And while this does seem like a rather ambitious agenda, the strength of it lies in the very fact that these goals are so interlinked and indivisible, meaning that gains in one will result in gains in the other. And as a health community, we are, of course, have focused on goal three on health and well-being, um, which includes, of course, the standalone target on reducing premature mortality by one-third due to NCDs. Uh, the parts highlighted in red on this slide indicate those other targets that are also directly related to NCDs, and as we'll see in a minute, um, also related to reducing the burden of breast cancer. Um, so NCDs cause more premature deaths than all other diseases combined. We know 16 million premature deaths annually. Of these, the greatest proportion are due to cardiovascular diseases, followed by cancers. In 2012, over 8.2 million deaths worldwide were attributable to cancer, of which over 500,000 deaths were specifically due to breast cancer. And over the next 10 years, an additional 19.7 million cases of breast cancer are expected to present. And we know 5.8 million women will, do, will die due to breast cancer. And again, here we can even see the last spin data because we know that uh, we have the statistics on women, but men and transgender people are often not included in these global statistics. Um, the inclusion of NCDs in the SDGs marks a change in thinking, signifying that NCDs are finally recognized as a priority for achieving sustainable development. So given that we have this 2030 agenda, what are the implications for action on health and NCDs and cancer within that? Um, again, you know, we, we have this very large menu of priorities and this ambitious agenda. And how do we keep health and NCDs high on the list as countries begin implementation? In addition to that, how will we finance in the, co in the context of this post-2015 era? Um, one of the main uh, views is that in order to achieve these health goals specifically and the SDGs in general, is to move from uh, fragmented silos to a systems-based approach. Um, and this siloed approach is, is one in which that the uh, development community has been operating for quite some time. And for health specifically, we know that universal health coverage, um, as you can see here, a quote from the current WHO Director General, Margaret Chan, is the single most powerful concept that public health has to offer. Um, and it will deliver health systems that provide equitable, affordable, accessible, quality health care. Um, and this is something, this concept can be broadened out to the broader agenda, um, as we can see in this slide, which shows that breaking down silos is really a requirement for achieving the 2030 agenda. This here is a slide from the OECD that shows that each of the uh, uh, 16 goals, we don't include the partnership goal here, and each of their targets it really includes the three dimensions of sustainable development under each goal, environmental, social, and economic. So if we are truly to achieve all three pillars of sustainable development, we will need integrated action across all of these goals and the involvement of multi-stakeholder partnerships. Um, NCDs are really a case study of integration. They're a prime example of the need to break down the silos and integrate systems. As we know, many of the risk factors for NCDs lie outside goal three on health, such as nutrition, goal two, climate change, goal 13, and ending poverty, goal one. Um, 
which means that you know the pursuit of partnerships is really a very vital and fundamental requirement for achieving our shared goals. So we know that we must pursue innovative partnerships that engage a range of stakeholders. And again, the NCD world has been at the forefront of this, engaging multi-stakeholder partnerships to strengthen health systems and improve prevention, screening, and treatment at all levels. So where does breast cancer fit within the 2030 agenda? And the reason I've talked about the interlinked and broad scope of this agenda and the place of NCDs within it is to better illustrate this very fact. Um, here is just a snapshot of the goals beyond SDG3 that affect NCDs and therefore breast cancer outcomes. We know that over 30% of cancer deaths could be prevented by modifying or avoiding key risk factors such as tobacco use, being overweight or obese, unhealthy diet, lack of physical activity, alcohol misuse, and air pollution, um, exposure to air pollution, whether that be indoor or outdoor. So action on these goals depicted here reduce exposure to risk factors that contribute to developing breast cancer. And forming partnerships with non-health sectors is essential for reaching any of these goals. As you can see, some of these goals lie in the health section, uh, within the health section, sector, of course, um, when we're talking about hunger, but also with education, energy, urban planning and development, and the climate sectors. Um, the NCD Alliance is actively engaging and working with the nutrition, climate, and urban planning communities, among others, as the links between these sectors and cancers and NCDs are clear. And finally, I'd like to leave you with some key opportunities for global advocacy over the next year, starting with World Cancer Day on February 4th. Um, this coming year it will fall on a Saturday, so much of the advocacy will also be on the 3rd, the Friday leading up to World Cancer Day. The high-level political forum at the UN in New York will be in July of 2017, and this is the main platform for review of the 2030 Agenda. During this session, countries have the opportunity to present reviews of their progress and challenges in implementing the 2030 Agenda. Following this, the second Global NCD Alliance Forum will be held December 9th to 11th in Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates and will bring together both NCD and non-NCD stakeholders to facilitate those multi-sectoral discussions and partnerships that I discussed earlier. Finally, all of these meetings lead up to the third UN high-level meeting on NCDs, which will review commitments made during the 2014 review on NCDs and the 2011 political declaration on the prevention and control of NCDs. And we, of course, will be sharing more information on all of these events in the following months, and I urge you to sus subscribe to our weekly newsletter to stay apprised of these updates. Um, and with that, I will leave it here, and I'm happy to answer any questions when we arrive at that stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, Priya Kanesan of NCD Alliance in New York. She set the stage right up front in, in our webinar and reminding us of promises governments have made relevant to breast cancer. Our next panelist is Dr. Pooja Ramakant, Department of Endocrine and Breast Surgery at King George's Medical University, or KGMU. Dr. Ramakant was a former senior endocrine and breast surgeon at, at the world famous Christian Medical College in Velour earlier, and he's a passionate advocate for preventing an early diagnosis of breast cancer. It is a personal pleasure welcoming you, Dr. Pooja Ramakant, to CNS webinars as we have worked closely with W Health Organization Director General's awardee, Professor Ramakant, over two decades on, on a range of public health issues. Welcome, and over to you, Dr. Ramakant. Thank you, Mr. Ashok Ramsarup. Thank you for the wonderful uh, introduction, and I'm happy to be part of it. And thanks, Priya, for telling us all the agendas. I hope you may be able to see the slides uh, about uh, the breast cancer management, the myths, the facts, and why and what we should know about it. Yes, coming through. Yeah, sure. If you see that today is the recent ICMR data, they say that more than 16 lakh new cancer cases in India will be diagnosed by 2020. And more than 8 lakh deaths may happen by 2020. And breast cancer, lung and cervical cancers have topped this list. And that is the surprising part and the sad part that we need to find out what is the reasons why this is rising and how can we 
stop it or prevent it and how can we treat those patients who have been diagnosed with it. If you see the paradoxes, people know, everybody in the village, in the remotest part of the country, if you see, people know about Pepsi and Coke. Everybody is using mobile. The technologies have gone to all people irrespective of their education status or the literacy status or the financial status. But the sad part is the cancer prevention information has not gone. So why can't we spread this knowledge as equally as uh, potentially as these uh, other information or technologies reach to all parts of the world. There are a lot of myths about breast cancer, like people think cervical cancer is the most common cancer in women. It's mostly genetic. If I don't have in the family, why should I worry about it? And all patients invariably die of cancer. Cancer is synonymous to death. Why should we go to a doctor to get it treated? And it happens only in women. So why should men worry about it? But the facts are, Breast cancer, unfortunately, has become the most common cancer in urban women and um, only 5 to 10 percent are hereditary. So it means that 90 percent are environmental induced or some other risk factors which do play a role, which is not hereditary, which is not transmitted in the family. And all cancers doesn't mean or is not synonymous to death. If we diagnose cancer in early stage, the cure rates are as high as up to 90 to 100 percent. But once the advanced stage comes, then the cure rates drop down to 50 to 70 percent. So the key note is that we should pick up as early as we can to have the best possible cure rate. And it happens in men too, but the frequency is quite less compared to women. But it do happen. So what is a step ladder approach of sorting out this problem? First, we have to find out what is the current level of awareness in our population, how much people do know correctly about it. What are the barriers in society that prevent the patient from coming to a doctor? Because once we know that these are the barriers, we can break those barriers. How can we break them? How can we spread more knowledge to all? And uh, how can we help people in fighting and preventing and treating cancer? So our aim right now is to concentrate, focus on creating awareness and finding out the barriers and breaking those barriers. We feel that there are two types of people. One who are ignorant and they don't know about anything about the disease and though then they say that they present it late. Other is what we call educated illiterates that who know very well about the disease but they still present late. Sometimes they, they try other pathies which avoid them from coming to us in the early stage. If you see this is the common scenario which we see it's a large huge fungating mass which is infected patient cannot bear the weight of the huge mass but still they know that they are suffering with disease, but still they present late. And when they present so late, then it becomes very difficult for us to manage and to give them the best possible cure rate. If you see, this is another scenario example of a lady. Both were from urban areas. They knew well, they had no financial problems, but still they had some barriers which prevented them from coming to us in much, much early or a, or a small size state when we could have given them the best possible cure. If you ask me what is really cancer, it's just a disease that makes some changes in the cell, what we call mutation, and the cell starts multiplying and they grow out of control, and usually people present with a hard lump. If the WHO statement says that most of the people who, that most people know their relative or their friend has suffered with breast cancer. So it has become that common that everybody knows that somebody connected to them suffered from breast cancer. And 80,000 new patients are diagnosed every year. So the incidence is rising, really alarming. If you see Tata Medical Hospital's data from Mumbai, which is one of the largest uh, cancer center, the cancer incidence in breast cancer has surpassed cervical cancer much earlier. This is 2000 data. So if you see, even 16 years earlier, it had surpassed cervical cancer, but still we are lacking behind in creating awareness and trying to pick up in the early stage. If you see age-wise distribution in India, it presents in the fourth and fifth decade. If you see the stage-wise distribution, there are four stages. We want them to come in stage one if they get a cancer, but unfortunately stage two and stage three are most common. And in rural areas, the stage three is still the most common. So how can up cancer in the early stage we can pick up by breast self-examination which we shall be discussing with you all and knowing about it having the awareness 
and clinical best examination by a paramedical staff who has been trained well by some doctor in developing countries who can examine the patients where the mammography facilities or technical facilities are restricted in the remote areas. So by these methods, we can definitely pick up cancer in the early stage. If you see the US data, the Western data, they present patients who present in at later stages, like fifth decade or sixth decade. And they have in situ cases, in situ means very small, tiny cancers, which have not crossed the basin membrane of the cell. So they talk about in situ, very small, tiny lesions, which are picked up on screening. But for us, the problem is a large masses, which are picked up by patients themselves on palpation. So the problems are there's no organized screening program in our country. We patients present late. Because of late stage, the cost of treatment goes high up because they opt for alternate therapies. There's very heterogeneous treatment facilities available in the country. The survival rate is low. There are more treatment related problems. So we have a big baggage of problems. So I hand over my presentation further to Professor Anand Mishra, who shall be discussing the risk factors and further managements once you introduce him. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Pooja Ramakant, Associate Professor, Department of Endocrine and Breast Surgery, King George's Medical University and Editorial Board Member of the Indian Association of Endocrine Surgeons. Now, well, Dr. Ramakant set the stage to invite Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Anand Mizra, Head of the Endocrine and Breast Surgery Department. KGMU. It's over to you, Professor, Mr. Amistra. Yeah, good evening, sir. Good evening. So there are, there are risk factors for breast cancer, and we can group them uh, uh, in modifiable and non-modifiable uh, risk factors. Now, there are certain factors which we cannot change, like hereditary factors, or there are some benign breast diseases which are at risk, or early menarche or late menopause. So somebody, these factors cannot be changed. But Nulliparity, breastfeeding, they can definitely change. Breastfeeding gives some protection. Obesity uh, has a mild risk factor and then alcohol intake, more than two packs, has a mild risk factor for the breast cancer. Now, the, if we see uh, in high risk population, by on the basis of these risk factors, we can divide the population, low risk, medium, moderate risk and high risk. And high risk population is the population which has uh, uh, genetic predisposition. In these population, the preventive strategies can be an annual mammogram and clinical breast examination every six to 12 months by a doctor. And it, is, it should be started at the age of 30 years. Then one should be always be aware of the breast health. There can be other risk strategy, uh, reduction strategies. And they, some of these patients who have uh, BRCA1, BRCA2 genes positive, then they are also recommended annual breast uh, MRI because in early age, the breasts are very dense. So in the mammogram, we take an X-ray film of the breast, but then we are not able to read in these their dense breasts the suspicious lesions. Now, after knowing the risk factors, we go to the diagnosis of the breast cancer and diagnosis of breast cancer is a very very easy thing yeah, and we call it triple assessment or triple test and it includes three components one is clinical clinical means a uh, detailed history of the patient means complaints and then an examination by a doctor then the next step is imaging so we image the breast by an ultrasound or an x-ray and low it is a low beam x-ray so we call it mammogram and the third component is an uh, pathology and pathology includes two things one just a fine needle a fine needle is put into the lump then a suction pressure is applied and something comes into the hub of the needle and then we prepare a slide we stain them with the chemicals and then we see, uh, the pathologists see this under the microscope and if there are suspicious cells then that that comes uh, uh, confirms the diagnosis and then another method if we cannot confirm it by the fine needle expression cyto cytology, then we do a core cut biopsy, means a small tissue and that tissue is examined. And by these three methods, uh, more than 95% of cases can be picked up. Now, this is a picture and then uh, the breast, if you see the breast, parent, uh, breast uh, organ, it has multiple ducts and then glands. So basically the uh, work of the breast is to produce milk and then feeding. So there are glands and then ducts. Now, and then in between these glands and ducts, there is filling material that is called fatty tissue. 
adipose tissue so breast can uh, these cancers can arise from a duct ductal tissue or they can arise from a glandular tissue or they are uh, later on they combine all these three three structures they can go on three three structures sometimes they go on to the skin so uh, basically these patients present with nipple discharge they will have some lump they will have distortion of the breast or there can be an ulcerative growth and then once it spreads from here then patient can have some lumps in the armpits now this is an is a mammogram i i was telling you uh, this is a low beam mammogram and then we a doctor pathologist can a radiologist can read there are some suspicious lesions like here there is a suspicious lesion and then there is as a suspicious lesion now once we have made the diagnosis so the treatment is multi modality it involves surgeon it involves radiologist it involves a medical oncologist now breast from beginning is considered as a systemic disease and systemic disease means it's a local manifestation there is a lump in the breast it is malignant it's a cancer but from the beginning we clinician think it to spread to whole of the body now if it is in early stage so after diagnosis before treatment we stage the disease and there are four stages of the disease the last stage is cancer has spread to the many parts of the body and first stage is just a beginning so in initial stages we give local form of treatment and local form of treatment is surgery different different types of surgery and then radiation back to the breast and in later on stages we give chemotherapy chemotherapy means whatever drugs in cancer is given they are called chemotherapy and these are in form of injections and then there are some tablets in some patients where hormones are positive then we give hormonal treatment and this hormonal treatment goes for now concept is for 10 years so it's a long treatment and it was it involves there are many doctors there are some uh, screening uh, tools available on net like a modified gale model and one can have the uh, assessment of the risk factors like this is this is there uh, available on the internet now we all know this angelina jolie effects she her mother and grandmother they both had uh, breast cancer and that was genetic genes positive so in fact she she had uh, this uh, reduction one of the reduction studies to have a subcutaneous mastectomy so she had both sides subcutaneous mastectomy and then implant implant thing so after that uh, her operation there was a surge of these reduction studies many many females they wanted that they wanted to have a subcutaneous mastectomy now there are certain criteria for genetic testing if there are genes are positive the age of breast cancer presentation less than 50 years multiple breast cancers there are specific type of breast cancer which we call as triple negative breast cancer then there are situations in uh, in the families when more than two members are having the cancer and one member is less than 50 years more than three members with cancer at any age any member who had a male breast cancer and some some races they they have risk factor of bilateral breast cancer now we were talking like uh, of breast self examination so this examination means every woman is, should be aware of her breast health and this examination is done in month uh, every once in a month and the ideal time is one week after the periods this examination can be done in inspection means you are standing in front of the mirror you just observe your breast shape of the both breast because from uh, directly you cannot see, you cannot see the lower half of the breast so you should observe your breast shape of the both breast position of the nipple and then any redness any puckering and uh, nipple retraction in the mirror and then once you, uh, during the you are changing your clothes or you, you are taking bath you can examine an examination should be done with the pulp of the fingers not with the tip of the fingers and there can be two methods one is starting from the nipple and you go in circular manner either centrifugal or centripetal and the other method can be vertical you start from the nipple middle side and you go vertically until the armpits and one of the positions can be when you are lying down put a pillow behind your back and then you examine and start from the medial side mid side and then you come to the outer side and then you should always examine the nipples try squeeze the nipple and see if there is any nipple discharge because mal uh, bloody discharge is one of the symptoms now breast self examination benefits are many it is easier to perform there is no cost involvement no equipments and no tra trained personnel needed needed 
Now there is another thing opportunist, opportunistic screening. We say that when when any woman is coming to the hospital with any complaints, she, she may be an attendant or she may be a patient. Then uh, if she is in the risk group, then we can ask for a mammogram if she is affordable. This is called opportunist screening and it is more relevant in our de developing countries. Now, how can we spread the awareness about breast cancer is we should talk about it. We should be, we should write role plays. We, there should be patient support groups. There, can, there should be awareness talk like this one, billboards, advertisement. Then there should be programs for breast health in school and colleges. We should collaborate with the social workers and then paramedical workers. Now this is this one this one is program which we organize in the, this October month awareness walks or awareness marathons. Then putting the billboards at the strategic points like in airports or strategic point in the hospital where the general public can read it. Now this is my last slide which I stress a lot and I always discuss ABC of the breast health. And A means awareness of the disease. So every every female should be aware of the, uh, this disease. In fact, all males should also be aware of the disease. Awareness, disease, every female is at risk of breast cancer. Then it is a treatable cancer in early stage. And then other thing is a third A is my, there is no alternative to surgery or pathy or definitive treatment. So no alternative pathy. B is for breast self-examination, so everybody should know how to examine his breast. And then if you find anything in your breast examination, one should undergo a clinical examination by a doctor, and then the doctor can advise you accordingly. So for prevention of breast cancer, we can only do ABC awareness, breast self-examination, clinical examination. Once a patient is suffering, then the treatment goes on. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, Professor Mishra. Uh, she is the head of the Department of Endocrine and Breast Surgery. Well, yes. all the presenters have broken, have broadened our horizon as we have surely saved the best for the last. Citizen News Service believes that community is central in driving health responses. Brett Miller is a courageous man who not only fought his battle with breast cancer, but also became determined and resolute to help other men who get diagnosed with breast cancer. He founded the Male Breast Cancer Coalition. We are very proud of you, Brett, and the MBCC, and the inspiring work you have done over the years. Well, salutes to you, to your courage, determination, and integrity to help the course. Well, it's over to you, Brett. Thank you guys for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, call, <laughs> tapping in from uh, Kansas City. Um, we'll just uh, we'll get started. I'm a, a six-year breast cancer survivor. Um, and here's some uh, stats for uh, male breast cancers according to American Cancer Society uh, for 2016. Um, about 26 new uh, 2,600 new cases of invasive breast cancer will be diagnosed this year. Um, 440 men um, approximately will die from breast cancer. Uh, this is attributed to the uh, late stages that it's diagnosed because men do not think that they can get breast cancer. Um, breast cancer is about 100 times less common among men than it is women, um, and the chances of a man getting in, uh, getting in his lifetime is about 1 in 1,000. Um, and the, uh, this is all according to American Cancer Society, so in the United States, this is not the world stats. Um, you know, so with, with that said, being said about some of the stats and everything, some of the risk factors for men are based on their age, their average age. Uh, according to breastcancer.org, is 68. Um, I was 24 when I was diagnosed. I was 17 when I first found the lump under my right nipple. Um, I went to a couple different doctors uh, at the time of discovering it, and each one said that it was a, uh, a lump. It was from puberty. It was a calcium buildup. It would dissipate and go away, not to worry about it. Um, 
fast forward to uh, current, as you can see, I am now a survivor and, uh, and helping build the awareness for men. Um, some other factors can be uh, family history, as, as, you, as you, uh, everybody else has said, is hereditary. Uh, there's a 5 to 10 percent chance of it being hereditary. Um, you know, uh, environment is part of the other reason, the high estrogen levels in men's um, and, and or radiation exposure. Um, but, uh, you know, but for me, it was not, it was not genetic. I got tested for the BRCA genes. Um, I have not, uh, I don't have them. Uh, my mom and I both got tested recently on the new My Risk um, test. It tests a, a much broader uh, spectrum of genes, and there are still no genes that uh, attribute to breast cancer for either of us. Um, so, with that being said, you know, when I was diagnosed uh, and I met with my surgeon, um, he was a great surgeon. Uh, he, you know, he looked at me and he told me that, you know, he's never he's never had to do male breast cancer surgery on somebody as young as I am. Um, if I were to have any questions, he could try to reach out and um, get in contact with some of the men he's done he had done the surgeries on previously. But most of them had done the surgery, taken time off work, and went back to work like nothing ever happened. Um, Here and now, it was kind of you know disturbing that you know there's no men out there willing to talk about this and he told me that if I was willing to share my story that he could see me being a face of male breast cancer and helping others. Um, hearing that from a surgeon that's been doing it for so long uh, was kind of uplifting so uh, that's uh, kind of how it all started. We started the Brett Miller uh, One T Foundation which in turn uh, helped with, with so, uh, so, uh, social media um, we uh, we met Sherry Ambrose out of New Jersey who uh, formed the Blue Wave and together we have uh, we, we combined and made the Male Breast Cancer Coalition. Um, the coalition, um, you can find us on malebreastcancercoalition.org and over on there we have many stories of survivors um, from all over the world and we continue to grow um, each day. Uh, we're here to uh, support men. Um, help them along the way, making sure that they they understand what is uh, coming uh, in their diagnosis. Um, you know, you will be sent to a women's clinic to uh, to get your ultrasound or mammogram. Um, you you'll be given a pink gown. You, everything is going to be pink. Um, don't be alarmed by it. It's just the way it is because this is a predominant uh, disease in women. Uh, we're just here to help you out, support you along the way. Ease, ease it, um, and in any way we can um, help our survivors um, get the treatment that they need. Uh, there's been several survivors that have been de uh, denied uh, treatments or medications from insurance, um, and we've been able to uh, write letters and, and tweet and, and do everything through social media that have in turn changed their decision and helped our men get the medication that they need to survive. Um, so um, here's a picture, if I go back to it, of our uh, Male Breast Cancer Coalition uh, homepage. And I'll go to one more little slide. Um, several years ago, I did uh, for the National Consortium of Breast Centers a breast self exam for men. Um, there is also uh, women's exams um, to properly show is a video instead of just picture slides of how to how to do a self breast, breast exam. Um, so if anybody would like to go to it, it's breastselfexams.org and all the information is on there. Um, the link you can also find on our coalition page um, and uh, up here and everything. So um, I think that's about all for me uh, at this point and stuff. I'm uh, willing to answer any questions if anybody has when we get to that point. So thank you for having me. and. Uh, I'll wait for questions. Thank you very much. That was breast cancer survivor and founder of the Male Breast Cancer Coalition, Brett Miller. Well, it's a good time to open the floor for questions and answers. Well, participants, please keep sending your questions using chat function or raise your virtual hand to request to speak. Let's begin the Q&A session. It's over to our Citizen News Service Managing Editor, Madam Shobha Shukla. Thank you, Ashok. 
Uh, we have a lot many questions pouring in. And before we just begin that, since we have Sherry Ambrose, co-founder of Male Breast Cancer Coalition with us today also, uh, would you like to share or make some comments, Sherry? Yeah. <laughs> so, we don't use them. So, I mean, they're going to, they can seal them up so that, you know, these stupid things don't. Sherry. Sherry. And he Sherry. put a cone up at the top, so if they. Sherry. Sherry. They're asking if you'd like to say something. Right. Sherry, would you, yes. would you like to share something or make some comments? You're welcome. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Meanwhile, meanwhile, we have Aarti Dhar a very senior journalist who was formerly with the Hindu and currently writes for the Indian Saga and CNS who would like to ask a question. Uh, she may be having some internet uh, connectivity problem, but Aarti, if you are able to ask a question, please go on. Yes, Aarti. Aarti, can you hear us? We are not able to hear you. Uh, Francis Okoye, Francis, do you want to ask a question? Francis, please ask a question. All right, as uh, these particip participants are connecting, we have a question from Rohit, who is a correspondent from patrika.com. And uh, Rohit says that breast cancer cases have been rising in India more so during the last five years. Uh, he wants to know if uh, increasing consumption of fast food has anything to do with this. Because he says earlier they, we were connecting breast cancer more with the Western world. And now we have many cases in India. Uh, so would Dr. Ramakant like to answer that question? Yeah, definitely fast foods, the frozen foods, the foods which have a lot of uh, carbohydrate, and these junk foods, the drinks which are very much concentrated with sugars, which is all carbohydrate, which all everything surmounts to obesity and the sedentary lifestyle. These are all linked to cancer cells growth. So definitely fast foods do have a link. So that way if you see the Indian diet which was traditional, which was freshly made food, which was a nice combination like rice and dal if you see, which is a combination of proteins and nice carbohydrates. So everything was a balanced diet. But uh, I think at some point we have gone to fast food and we have gone to the frozen food to facilitate and to have the easy modalities. But definitely they are harmful for our health. So definitely fast foods do have association with cancer. Uh, thank you, Pooja. Uh, we have Dinah Wangari from Kenya who wants to ask a question. Dinah, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. you can. Yes. Uh, my question specifically is to Brett Miller. Uh, I'd first like to say uh, thank you for sharing your story and I'm actually moved by your dedication and effort to raise awareness on male breast cancer. So uh, in particular from African societies and culture, you find that uh, there's a lot of stigma at the same time that uh, men survivors are not willing to speak up, yet this is something that's actually been diagnosed in our hospitals. So I'd want to find out that what is an example that you could think of that in a situation on the ground that men respond to that could provoke a change in strategy that us in the African societies we might want to emulate? Um, thank you. Uh, 
one of the uh what i've realized over the years and stuff is that a lot of men don't believe that they have breast tissue and i think that's part of the problem um everybody's got breast tissue um it's just to a certain extent how much you have uh based on your body but it, it's it's racing the stigma that it's um that men don't have breast tissue so it's making sure everybody understands that and if it's comfortable for men to say that they have chest cancer or pet cancer or or whatever it is to make them feel comfortable about you know the disease they just need to understand that it's still considered breast cancer in the medical world, world and stuff but there are others out there um there's a support system out there we're out there there's others other support system out there for them and stuff that and they don't need to be ashamed of it anymore uh that you know if you diagnose if you if early if you detect it early and you can get to the doctor um and you can get it diagnosed early and stuff that you can survive this if you let it go and be as a typical male and not go to the doctor until it's you know the last minute or you're really sick or you you know if you break you know if you break your arm or something like that, not being stubborn and going to the doctor early enough um, that you can beat the disease it is beatable but you have to be proactive in getting to the doctor you are your own best advocate for knowing your body but the doctor will be the one to diagnose you and tell you that it is breast cancer and you know along, along the way um, one of our survivors Michael Singer he's in uh, he's in the Bronx New York um, I was on the Katie Kirk show uh, it's about three years since I've been on there um, but he he was two years diagnosed um, and he didn't speak about it at all um, after you know during his uh, diagnosis to when he saw um, me on the Katie Kirk show his wife actually called him into the room saying that you know she was watching it and had uh, you know I was on and then he sat down and he watched it and, and literally that uh, that next day after it being aired um, he had contacted us uh, contacted us and stuff and he was like you know, I'm so uh, proud of seeing somebody else as young as you, Brett, for speaking out that, uh, you know, that I, I'm not ashamed of this anymore and stuff. So he's, um, he's been, a, he's been a very uh, pronounced uh, uh, advocate in our society um, for Male Breast Cancer Coalition. Um, and, uh, you know, he was affected personally, not only by himself being diagnosed, but his, his sister had died from breast cancer as well. So he is a very adamant in our community now so it's it, it's great to hear my story helping others um it just ma it makes me feel better it makes me keep wanting to keep going and and not stop until you know we can change the stigma and put a little splash of blue in the sea of pink as we always say uh the Milk breast cancer coalition thank you thank you thank you Peter. thank you uh, i i request the participants once again to please keep sending your questions using chat function or raising your virtual hand to request to speak. Uh, we have a lot many from the transgender community in Delhi and other areas who wrote to CNS and wanted to know why are we leaving transgenders behind when we talk of breast cancer. Trans men and trans women have breasts too. Any comments from any of the panelists? And Dr. Ramakant, would you like to answer yeah, this? Transgender, that's a good point which we have raised because we talk very less about the incidence of breast cancer and there is very limited data available on transgender and breast cancer incidence. And it has like a double-edged sword. One is they have less of breast tissue. So the cancer may not be that, uh, the incidence is not very high. But the problem on the other side is the tissue is less, but it is very dense breast compared to the uh, uh, male or female breast, if you see. So the dense breast per se is a risk factor for developing breast cancer. So the data is very variable. There are few anecdotal reports of few cancers happening in transgender. So we don't have a large series to quote what is exact incidence and what are the risk factors. But because uh, in transgender, the estrogen hormone also is less compared to the male or female versions. So the exposure to cancer cells is less. Estrogen hormone is slightly pro for cancer formation. So that is one of the risk factors, which is more in females. That is why females have more breast cancers compared to men. 
but in transgender the estrogen is so the incidence per se should be less but the dense breast slightly predisposes to breast cancer formation but the incidence is less so there are few anecdotal reports but as such they are not at very high risk i may i may, I may add that uh, uh, the breast cancer if you see the risk for the breast cancer and i told you in the risk factors that the uh, breast feeding has some protective phenomena protective effect and if you see why protective effect because there is a menstrual cycle and it's the there is also a breast cycle the both both cycles are related by hormones now the usually the breast cycle is of 30 days and if a female has delivered a baby so she is uh, nine months there are no cycles and then nine months breast uh, feeding so at a total of 18 months there is no feeding so no periods no breast cycle so because of that reason every breast cycle there are some changes in the breast and because of that way it gives some protective phenom protective effect and that's why we have kept uh, risk factors early early menarche and late menopause and in transgenders since there is no regular menstrual cycle so there is no exposure of these high levels of hormones and there are no breast cycle in these transgenders so because of that reason they do not have a very high risk Uh, they are not very high risk cases for breast cancer that is one more reason one reason but if they develop the breast cancer the breast tissue is very less so these they may rapidly progress to advanced breast stages uh, thank you professor anand mishra uh, for adding that very important information there uh, we have a question for priya from a journalist from philippines who wants to know what are the top recommendations for governments to reduce breast cancer deaths by 1/3 by 2030 as envisaged in the sustainable development goals uh, thank you very much for the question um i think our uh viewpoint is that in order to reduce the the deaths from breast cancer we have to look at some of the modifiable risk factors of course there we have the genetic risk factors and some of the modifiable risk factors um such as tobacco use misuse of alcohol obesity um linked to uh in uh, poor diet and lack of physical activity and how we can really promote um the behaviors we know that can help minimize uh, exposure to certain risk factors and a lot of this comes with civil society advocacy um culturally sensitive advocacy that fits within different uh different um settings um and constraints and so the WHO does have some best by practices listed in the global action plan um it's specifically in appendix 3 that address um that address uh risk factors for breast cancer and cancer in general including early screening um and of course we know that there are barriers to achieving early screening due to the different societal um barriers that many women and even men face um so a lot of this comes down to education which links back to advocacy from civil society uh thank you priya uh, tesfai basor from ethiopia wanted to ask a question uh just by uh, are you able to ask the question yourself it would be great yes very thank you very much most of uh, my questions are answered through the presentations okay so you don't have any uh, means your queries are satisfied or oh, that is great uh, that's a great plus point for yeah. our panelists who have because Yes, I will thank you very much. You and the panelists, I'm satisfied. Yes. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Uh, uh, there is a question from Pakistan uh, for uh, I think uh, Dr. Ramakant and Dr. Mishra may be able to answer. What is your recommendation for screening for early diagnosis for women, men, and transgender people? Brett shared that he had the first symptoms at the age of 18 years. So, what is uh, the recommendation for screening for early diagnosis? At what age? And also, what for Pooja and Dr. Mishra specifically? What is the average delay in diagnosis for your patients? 
in, in a country like India in hospitals where you have been working? So um, uh, I would like to start with the second question. So there is usually a delay and then if you see I have stressed on the A, ABC of the breast health. There is, there is no alternative pathway. So some of the patients when we diagnose breast cancer, they do not continue with the treatment with our, our advice. They go to some alternative pathways and then they develop from early stage, they advance to locally advanced stage and then they come back. Uh, we usually see delay and delay is usually six months to 18 months. It, it varies. Uh, if you see, uh, we are a referral hospital. So we cannot give you the exact data because some, sometimes we get patients from different hospitals. We get uh, diagnosed patients from the different consultants. I mean, gynecologists, general surgeons, or physicians, or uh, referral people. So exact data, we cannot tell what is the delay. But there is definitely a delay after the diagnosis in many cases. And then the first question was uh, a symptom and 18 years of age, and then uh, uh, screening. So I think um, um, it's just self breast examination. She should have a clinical breast examination from a doctor. And then at that age, only a breast ultrasound is sufficient to see if there is any abnormality in the breast. I think that uh, gives you the answer. Okay. Dr. Ramak, thank you, Dr. Mishra. Dr. Ramakant, would you like to add something? Yeah, screening recommendation as per the guidelines they say to have uh, annual mammogram after 50 years of age and uh, biannual that is once in two years after 40 years of age. That is the US guidelines which they quote. But the problem in India is that um, we see patients in late 30s and early 40s. So if you start doing the mammogram after 40 years or 50 years, then that is too late for the screening. That becomes more diagnostic. So we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have Indian guidelines to say that when should we start screening. But uh, ultrasound is done before 35 years of age as breast is very dense before that age and mammogram to be added after 35 years of age. So that is the US guideline which I told you. Indian guidelines are slightly like opportunistic screening. That is high risk people who come to the hospital, we screen and do imaging. And for transgenders, there is no as such recommendation guidelines for them because the data is very scanty and it's very scarce. So there are no large number of patients who have been diagnosed to make a guideline for them. But I think everybody should do self-examination starting the moment they become adult like 18 years onwards and add a mammogram once they are 40 years plus. And if somebody is high risk in the family, somebody got cancer, they may start at 30 years or 35 years itself. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramakant. I want to ask one more question. What is the current survival rate for breast cancer in India? And uh, why is it so hugely different from countries, say, like uh, South Korea uh, and other in, developed countries? Because of the early stage in South Korea, they diagnose at the screening point when they're tiny cancers, earliest possible stage picked up on imaging because they have strict screening guidelines. We diagnose patients when they themselves feel the lump and then there's a delay coming to us so it becomes slightly locally advanced cancers. As the cancer stage advances, the survival rate falls down. So that is one of the reasons. Other reason is very heterogeneous. People don't follow strictly the chemotherapy, the guidelines, the, all their many regimens or the treatment protocol. Some may operate and then the patient defaults. So definitely they don't complete the treatment. So then that reduces the risk. But when they recur, they come back after six months, eight months, or one year, then we add all the other treatments. So all therapies, all modalities are not added, and they're not optimal treatment uh, at, at remote areas. So I think it's not homogeneous treatment facilities available in our country. That also uh, affects and deters the cure rates. Thank you, Dr. Ramakant. Uh, we, uh, we have Sherry Ambrose with us, who is the co-founder of Male Breast Cancer Coalition. Sherry, would you like to make a comment? Hi. Yes, it's me. Yes. Okay. Yes, please go on. You're on the call. Okay. okay. How can I help you? <laughs> any any comments? Any special comments you would like to make? 
Um, I think I've been sending a few through. Uh, this has been a great panel. I thank you so much for including us. Um, we are here for all men around the world. Uh, we want awareness to begin um, with the medical community. I think uh, a lot of times uh, some of these men present symptoms to the doctors and the doctors actually give them a salve or a cream and tell them, you know, see me in a week, it'll go away. Um, we hear that all too often. So that's why I've been saying it begins with the medical community. Um, we also need, I know here in the United States, we need our insurance companies to be educated as well. Uh, because they are going by very, very old rules uh, when it comes to covering these men. Uh, a lot of them are losing their houses, they're losing their jobs, they lose their families because they basically go bankrupt trying to pay for the medical treatment and the drugs. And this is not happening with the women because the women are covered. So um, there's a lot of, um, I can understand why the men are reluctant because not only is the cancer beating them down but also trying to pay for it and it's just, it's really terrible what's happening to them. So we are here to support them, we are here to be a voice for them and advocate for them. Um, we are also involved with many of the large cancer organizations here in the United States. Um, we are partners with the metastatic breast, we're actually members of the metastatic breast cancer alliance. Uh, we partner with the uh, Breast Cancer Research Foundation. Um, there's, there's a whole host of them. So we welcome anyone to um, come to our site and that includes members of the transgender community as well. If we can help, um, we certainly will try. Thank you, Sherry, because I was about to ask you that does your coalition intend to work with the transgender people as well? Uh, but you have already answered it. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Ashok Ramsuru, our, our today's moderator and award-winning journalist and former senior program producer of South African Broadcasting Corporation, wants to ask a question. So, yes, thank Ashok, you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, well, I want to uh, thank Mr. Brett. For, should, he should be lauded for his you know, honest and eloquent uh, discussion on breast um, cancer. He actually made me aware of what's going on in thank the you. world. And uh, I just need to ask a very simple question. What is the most common type of breast cancer found? Any of the panelists? If, if you, uh, yeah, it's a pathological type you want to ask, so it is infiltrating ductal carcinoma, so it is arising a combination of the, from the lining of the ducts and from the glands which are there in the uh, uh, breast. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, before we end, I would like each presenter to make one quick point in as lesser time as possible. We have already exceeded the time by two minutes, but starting with Priya, the, just one final point. Priya, uh, in any order, Priya, uh, Dr. Ramakant, Dr. Mishra, and Brett. So I say ABC of the breast health, awareness, breast examination, self breast examination, and everything, anything is there, a clinical breast examination by a doctor. I'll say stay healthy, please exercise, and don't be obese. I would say that we have to address the uh, non-health risk factors and look at multi-sectoral partnerships outside of the health sector. Thank you. And finally, Brett, the uh, start of I would, today's... <laughs> I will just go uh, simple and say our, uh, the two slogans that we have, the one for the Brett Miller One Teeth Foundation is, guys, don't be afraid to touch yourself. And for the Male Breast Cancer Coalition is, is our hashtag, men have breasts too. So be sure to check yourselves and get to the doctors if you find any lumps or anything that you're uh, afraid of. Thank you. And finally, Ashok. Ashok Ram Surup, our moderator. What would you like well, to thank say? You, well, what I would like to say, I must thank the entire panel. They've been so great 
actually you made me aware of what the importance of breast cancer, not only to me, to, then to my entire family, and I think to the rest of the world. I think we, used to, we need to know more about breast cancer. Thank you so much. And thank you to all our panelists and participants. As always, we will be sending the recording of the webinar to all of you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.